Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, today, obviously, we have great weather, so I guess quite a few people enjoy the sun. Uh, but actually, we are very happy to have Professor Radium Joe from University of Texas at Arlington to give it a talk here. Uh, professor Joe is a distinguished university professor at UTA. And actually, I first met him uh, like around more than two years ago, right? So we had a conference, actually a photonics conference, uh, society conference. And at that time, he was already very famous for uh, the photonic crystal membrane devices and also all those uh, flexible photonics and integrated photonics work. And uh, since then, he has been uh, uh, working a, a lot on the, uh, what uh, we'll hear about the third generation of semiconductor laser, which is called pixels. So for a lot of, a lot of crystal, what do you count the uh, emission lasers? So uh, basically, uh, Professor Joe's uh, work is making great impact. And he was the elected fellow of SPIE. For those of you who don't know, SPIE stands for International Society for uh, Optical Engineering, and also we have the Federal of Optica, formerly known as the uh, uh, Optical Society of America, and he has many uh, uh, awards, uh, prestigious awards on distinguished scholar and also research from UTA. So uh, it's really a great honor to uh, have him here, discussing about the next generations of lasers you can see that impact our everyday life. Thanks, Rito. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank. <laughs> well, thanks, Jifong, for the invitation and the kind introduction. Uh, definitely, it's a great pleasure to be here, especially with the nice weather. I guess probably somebody said I brought it from Texas. You know, you guys are warmer than in Texas. I checked Texas is two degrees less than in here. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, so today, I will talk about uh, a few things happening in my group. I try to be kind of more general and with some content. But I, OK, feel free if you guys want to interrupt, ask questions. I don't know how it's a format. OK, uh, definitely, if you, you know, I would, would like to have more interactions with you guys as well. So the title of the talk today is uh, Photonic Crystal Lasers. And I added word semiconductor membranes, just to be clear for smart society and the biomedical applications. Before I start, I will quickly introduce or acknowledge my current and former group members, uh, you know, previous PhD postdocs, as well as current group members, uh, contributed to the work. Many collaborators uh, contributed to the project or discussions we uh, were covering today. And also, of course, the funding agency. So, semiconductor probably is a buzzword now, uh, looking to see how the semiconductor brings a transformation to the society, especially start off with electronics. We all, you know, probably carry a few electronics uh, for each of you guys. So, famous Moore's law, law suggesting we are probably can reaching a trillion transistors, a trillion transistors in a single chip, okay, by 2030. And you guys may be familiar with the chat GPT, right? It was enabled by really the electronics, partially, of course, photonics as well behind, I guess. It's a kind of 54 billion transistors per GPU, and there was lots of GPUs to support you guys work on chat GPT. Okay? So electronics definitely is the dominant technology uh, in the last 20th century and will continue to be. In, on top of electronics, I believe, especially we are going to a smart society looking for, you know, kind of AR, VR, virtual reality, whatever, like metaverse. Photonics play equal important role, or maybe even more. So people argue 21st century will be age of light. A century will have optics photonics as a dominant technology alongside with the photonics. Just give a very busy cloud, uh, uh, chart here, shows where photonics are, right? From networks, data center, uh, to, of course, mobility, LIDAR, imaging, quantum, right, to defense space, like, you know, uh, direct energy laser weapons, uh, laser communications, you know, uh, Starlink, for example, of course, biomedical surgery, you know, imaging, to laser manufacturing. So virtually everywhere uh, looking for photonics. I put that in the word laser because my research focus on laser primarily now, so I put actually also equally laser be applied in those uh, areas. So since this uh, John sentiment is about society impact, about and how, to, how relevant, right? So I pull up a slide I put together maybe 10 years ago. Think about you know, what photonics can do in terms of solving the 
society challenge, let's call it grand challenges. So I looked at a few areas, information, optical interconnect I mentioned earlier. Of course, we need a connectivity, the, the enormous uh, amount of bandwidth. So ideally, we want the information carry or transmission to be zero energy, or zero code, and meaning extremely low energy, right? So uh, that means the capacity, speed, and ultimately human machine interface, right? So think about this kind of grand challenge in the future, even though we are not there yet, but it seems to be less kind of dream or wish list. From the energy sustainability, what the photonics optics can do is we know, uh, of course, you can looking for renewable energy, right? Photovoltaics, you know, kind of different kind of form of you know, uh, energies to uh, reduce the carbon footprint, photosynthesis, etc. Also energy efficiency, solid state lighting, internet, etc. And then looking for natural resources, how to address those challenges. Uh, ideally, try to minimize the resource we are using uh, for a sustainable future. In terms of security sensing image areas, that's also a constant issue for us going forward, right? Uh, how to be able to have a you know, security information support into the storage transfer, uh, and then how to be able to support the image in sensing in a society, and of course, the resilience, adaptive self-healing, kind of idea like a human body where can, can be very reliable in any kind of environment or, uh, situation. And the quantum security, et cetera, that's coming uh, even more now. And finally, health, adaptive, photonics, that's kind of one of the major areas, probably here, very strong, biomedical imaging, photonics applications. Everybody wish to be healthy and uh, live long and live happy. So we are already looking to, you know, uh, uh, you know, bionics, you know, uh, bio, you know, mimic functions, uh, called, and in addition, some of the things we talk about the bio structures. So this kind of long-term, I would think, uh, uh, societal challenges and the photonics, optics can potentially contribute. So now let's get into the specific areas uh, I will be talking about today. So primarily, we have been working on two kind of platforms based on semiconductors. The first one is called the photonic crystal structures. So if you have not heard the photonic crystal structure, essentially it's a two-dimensional nanoscale structures by theoretical modular the refractive index material. For example, a piece of silicon. You just drilling holes to create a kind of index contrast between air and the semiconductor. And if you do it right, light and reduction will be modified. So basically it's a way how to manipulate light using this kind of periodic structure. A simple example I can see later on, butterfly wings is a periodic structure from nature. Or your opal or some people like a diamond. Those are kind of examples of the periodic structure from nature. We try to make it for a specific application we try to use. So that has been a primary platform we have been working on throughout the years now. Uh, another platform we call the membrane photonics. The idea is make the silicon thin and flexible so that we can either put on the flexible substrate or can integrate in a different platform by stacking. Uh, there are many new ways to do integration, so then you can do that. So based on these two basic structures, we have been looking to many different devices. Uh, that's kind of my focus, uh, especially optical electron devices uh, in my group. Uh, the first one I'll be talking today is called the photonic crystal surface emitting lasers. It's one type of kind of semiconductor laser devices. Uh, was kind of started probably uh, in the last in, uh, 20 years or so. So I will talk about some of the research advances, especially in, uh, in my group, and why this is unique, what's the potential of this technology. Uh, on the other hand, by incorporating photonic crystal structure in the membrane, we'll be looking for many kind of functional structures, especially like a different kind of optical filtering or reflector, different novel optical structures, and uh, with a context for applications in biomedical sensing areas. So that's the second topic I will spend in the half, second half, looking for heterogeneously integrated photonic crystal membranes, especially give an example of this uh, bioresorbable implantable photonic crystal sensor uh, applications. So I look at the first one, uh, photonic crystal surface media stand for pixels. So a brief intro about lasers. For those of you may you know, not familiar, semiconductor laser uh, study for laser and for light amplification by stimuli emission of radiation. It's kind of amplified. It's different from LEDs. Uh, it's a coherent light source. Can have lots of unique features, right? That basic structure here involves 
uh, game media, light emitting material, with, um, uh, with the feedback, so then they can have this kind of oscillation of it, resonance forming, forming this kind of uh, highly coherent uh, light emission with narrow spectrum and the direction of beam emission. So the first one was uh, invented in 1962, the semiconductor laser. Uh, the, the laser itself was invented in 1959. Uh, and in fact, this was, you know, as reported in the New York Times then, a solution seeker problem. People don't know what's the, what's the use for the laser, right? I guess you guys may ask the same question now, right? But indeed, look, now we are seeing 6.7 billion just laser components. Not to think about the like, enabled market in the applications. So laser is there everywhere, right? So I mentioned already, you know, fiber optic networks early days. Towards now, Intel, for example, is an electronic company, developed a hybrid laser into their transceiver and also into their chip now to looking for high performance computers, looking for transceivers for data centers. So optics is already there working with electronics. So that's kind of first generation lasers. Second generation lasers is, was invented in 1977. It's called VIXO, stands for Vertical Cavity Surface Emitting Laser. The idea is basically two parallel reflector DBR mirrors forming this vertical cavity, and the light emission uh, is out of plane. Okay, this initially primarily for data center. Now it's on your iPhone, smartphone, smartphone or many consumer electronics, your mouse, Printer, many, many areas, applications. And it's very super cheap now, it's mass production. And also you do the application market area, I talk about you know, also multi-billion dollar revenue in terms of those lasers. So combined you can see kind of 10 billion-ish kind of uh, laser component revenue already. Uh, and it enabled the whole photonics market to towards probably trillion or tens of trillion dollar uh, you know, photonic technology enabled uh, areas. So then those lasers are there. So what's the need for laser research, right? So one of the issues I argue here is you need a higher power. How scale power, okay? Well, you can think, well, easy. Just pump more current, right? So, I mean, if we look into this uh, scheme, sorry, uh, uh, okay. Okay, look into the scheme here. As you increase the laser size, laser aperture, your power can increase linearly, in theory, right? If you assume the same quantum efficiency, et cetera. The challenge here is, though, is that while you can get a so-called single mode, nice beam output, when your aperture is very small, that means you get a so-called single mode operation. You can see this nice gaussian beam here. When your aperture size is a few microns, whether it's VIXO, or edge emit laser where you're in a rich waveguide structure with a few microns. By the time you get into over 10 micron or ish, it becomes so called multi-mode. So mode degrades, and your mode quality degrades, then it results lots of issues and challenges in terms of application, that degrading your performance becomes a multi-mode. And intrinsically, if you look at the VIXO here, here's the cross-section VIXO structure, DBR, top and bottom, that's the emission aperture here. So when the aperture is very small, less than the lambda, the wavelength of the material, you get less of a nice single mode operation. However, when you get a very large aperture, you get a multi modes. That's where the issue intrinsically limits the power scaling to maintain a single mode operation. So the question is, can you get a high power single mode lasers, right? So in that application, why would the high power single mode? I just give some examples, right? So the first one, direct energy, or you guys may know Star Wars, right? A laser weapon, right? You need this car to be high beam and to be able to kill, right? So you need a very high beam quality, high power. So that's you need that. Laser communication, long distance beam, same thing, right? You need the beam quality and the high speed, et cetera. Starlink. Of course, LiDAR, you can see far away your car driving, you can see far dis long distance with good beam, data centers, and even quantum where you need a high beam quality, high power as well. So there are lots and lots of applications need a high power single mode lasers. So one of the solution is called uh, pixels, I mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, you can elucidate here, it's a cartoon shoe kind of structure. It's a semiconductor solid device. There are no moving parts whatever, so it's kind of as, same as the first generation AGM laser or second generation VIXO. Uh, in terms of the basic structure, I kind of zoomed in looking, consists of a few layers. One of the key layers here, first start looking at the photonic crystal layer here. 
I mentioned it's a two-dimensional lattice structure. You can see is this kind of uh, drill holes, essentially. Literally drill hole in the nanoscale drilling by, for example, using E-beam lithography to form a nanoscale pattern. And we etch using reactive eye etching to etching into the semiconductor material, especially the structure is in the order of a few hundred nanometer range. So we have to do the nanoscale fabrication. And so once we form this nanoscale structure, then we have this uh, light emitting layer here next to it. So they're evidently coupled. We'll see, I will show you an image later on. Then we have a fo formula, complete de device structure by formula electrode. So you can electro pumping, and they can create a kind of laser cavity here. L the operating principle here is this two dimension lattice. You can think about it as kind of uh, black scattering. So that means light bouncing back and forth whenever the like, lattice uh, discontinuity or like, contrast. Okay, so bounce back and forth. If you can design such that a particular resonance can be built up due to the periodicity, and in this case, a two-dimensional lattice, then you can form a certain resonance in plane, in this plane of the structure, a 2D lattice, okay? And if you design right, then you can have this 2D lattice, single mode, single resonance, with a very large area, okay? There are no limit at all. So in principle, you can make a, as large as you want, a single mode emitter device. That's in principle, right, in theory. At least that gives us a, a route towards potentially large area single mode operation. And then, in terms of light emission, if you look into you know, kind of implant scattering formula mode, then you can design, if the mode design such that the mode is leaky, that means intrinsically the mode, once it's forming implant resonating cavity or structure, eventually leak out vertically. So then your mode formation is in plan, but your mode in, the light emission is in a third dimension, vertical. That's a, a kind of basic, uh, quick explanation about this uh, pixel structure. Here shows the cross section of view where you have a quantum wave structure, as you see here, and a two dimensional lattice. This shows the mode distribution in a structure. So the key here is make sure your mode overlap with your quantum wave structure and your photonic capacity has to be sufficiently large enough so then you can have a strong so-called, we call it eminent and the coupling. Then your light can be amplified, oscillated inside this 2D lattice to create a kind of lasing action. So it's not a traditional fabric anymore. It's a two-dimensional lattice-based uh, resonator here, okay? And one of the pioneers is no doubt from Kyoto University. Uh, this paper, they first demonstrated that indeed, you can get a one wire single mode laser based on a few hundred micron aperture. First experiment demonstration. So you have quite a few good unique features. High collimated beam, high power, single mode, and you can do large aperture, you can see it's a very large area. Compared to the first two generations, I kind of generated this chart here uh, uh, in a spider web here, show in terms of a few key specific performances. For example, looking for power. Age emitter probably is better than the Vixel power scaling. You can make a large area for the single aperture devices, but a Pixel wins still because you can just make a large. More importantly, you can maintain a high beam quality. Otherwise, you couldn't do with the either Vixel or your 80 meter laser here, okay? And then the speed, we believe, based on our simulation calculation, can win even compared to Vixel, even though Vixel can be higher speed as well. And additionally, you can have a multi-wavelength capability and a beam steering capability. There are lots of new features enabled by this technology. So I think almost it's kind of ideal laser platform with great potentials here. So now let's into uh, kind of some details, looking to you know the challenges, how to design and to be able to demonstrate this structure. So I start looking into this cavity design first, looking to essentially how to realize this kind of cavity structure. Uh, so what do we have been work on over the last you know, probably five, 10 years now on this pixel technology uh, has built up a lot of understanding in terms of the, you know, optical design as well as heterostructure design. So then we also started trying to transfer the technology. So with a ST, STTR program from our Army, uh, we, you know, we could, uh, SMG Tech work on this uh, 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 modeling tool, a laser simulation tool in principle, anybody you can access to use it in a sense, right? Where we look into four aspects or four modules, 
optical design, looking for cavity design, what kind of lattice structures, air hole size, index contrast, the thickness of the like PC, photonic crystal layer, et cetera, and looking for uh, electrically like carriers in the header structure, how to inject the charges, how to balance the charge injecting, how to maximize the efficiency, et cetera, and then looking for materials, the like game model, et cetera, and then finally to predict the performance. What's the you know, threshold? What's out of the power, et cetera, we can try to look into. So that's kind of module we have uh, developing, and some of the modules are already uh, more or less available. Then we fit into our experimental part, look into fabrication, material growth, regrowth, fabrication package testing, and then we refine a package. So the model is being developed and refined as we, we are speaking. So a few slides, let's go walk through the process when we do the design. We, as I mentioned, it's a two-dimensional lattice. You can see here is a, in a two-dimensional uh, top view here, show this air hole structure with the radius R, sitting in the background. In this case, for example, it could be galmasonite material. So you have an index contrast between air, is a one, and a index for galmasonite, let's say around one micron, about 3.5-ish for, for the index. And the lattice constant A here, as well as the thickness of the PC layer and the index contrast. That's the key parameters we need to consider when we design the lattice. And here, just choose an example, uh, a 980 galvanometer based uh, header structure uh, cavity design. This kind of typical resonance features, we can see multiple resonance here. So in general, it's not a single resonance. We just have to pick the right resonance here for our laser structure. So those, each one of the potentially can be a laser resonance structures. And then we fit into the looking at the Q factor, you know, et cetera. And then this one shows this uh, index contrast of the header structure as well as the mode overlap, basically the field overlap I showed earlier. So make sure the overlap of the, the field, the E field, with your uh, you know, PC lattice as well as the quantum wave regime. So that they get a so called confinement factor and a coupling coefficient, et cetera, for low threshold lasing. So those are kind of a few outcomes based on the design. And then finally, based on some you know, detailed calculation, we can estimate in terms the quality factor of the cavity resonance. Uh, you can see here uh, this blue one, and also the confinement factor, for example, in this case, the quantum wheel, the overlap of the field with the quantum wheel structure. A higher is better always, right? But you have to balance between quantum wheel and the photonic crystal cavity. And finally, we can ex ex uh, predict the gain threshold. The gain threshold is basically a minimum gain material, uh, uh, mode of gain required for lasing, right? So low is better if you want to get a laser, right? So generally speaking, you want, for example, in this case, we look at the PC thickness and the gain threshold relation. So we can say optimize thickness to this so that get a low threshold lasing. Finally, we can then predict once we design the complete the iteration of the optical electric design result in optimal laser design. Then we look into what kind of power can we get. What's the, you know, that's kind of predicted out in terms of uh, emitted power versus current and voltage versus current. Typically, we refer to LIV, light, the current voltage curve. Uh, for different size of the device, you know, this is the average size D here in the later dimension, how big the laser they are. So generally speaking, you know, if you have a 250 micron aperture device, get about 10, 20 watts. But if you want to get a you know, one millimeter or 1,000 micron aperture, you can get you know, a few hundred watt, okay, in principle. And if you want to get a kilowatt, just to make it larger, 10 centimeter, okay, or, or 10 millimeter, one centimeter size. So it's potentially can expand a scale to very large uh, areas. So now let's look into, can we demonstrate? What's the performance can we see here? That's also lots of challenges as well, you can see. Here is just the fabrication process flow. Generally speaking, we start with the so-called epitaxial growth. That means a wafer, let's say galamastonite substrate, okay? Then we grew the header structure based on our design, different kind of layers of structures for laser formation. So we grew up to the quantum wheel to the cladding, the photonic crystal layer, then we pattern it to form a two-dimensional photonic lattice using the EVM lithography, RRG etching process, dual is nanoscale holes, essentially, on the semiconductor surface. And then we do a regrowth, we put the material back into the uh, epitaxial chamber to do this uh, uh, regrowth to complete the whole structure, including the cladding and the, and the contact layer on the top. So basically, the formula whole laser structure. Then we put the electrode on, okay? That's the P-metal, for example, and the formula MESA. 
Then we flipped it over to bond on the heat sinker uh, substrate. You can remove the substrate, bond on the like, diamond, and flip it over. Then we put another contact on the substrate side. In this case, the ring contact. So light will come in from the inside, the substrate side. Okay. So basically, put it back uh, up, upside down. The P would be a metal reflector on the bottom with the heat sink. In this case, could it be diamond, could it be silicon structure, and light coming out from the surface. That's it. So it's really, really straightforward per se in a sense, but of course uh, it's all in the devil in the details here. Here I just choose an example. Uh, we started work on this particular process uh, a few years ago. Uh, here I choose the you know, kind of structure I excluded already in terms of the first epithelial growth, patterning and regrowth and the bonding to the diamond accessory, okay, schematic. Here I choose the device structure. So this kind of a few hundred micron device area formed by e-beam patterning, okay, and etching process. Here is a structure. Another subtle detail I didn't mention is you can change or design your uh, photonic crystal structure for different applications, different device size, et cetera. There are different optimization. I won't get into detail here. In this particular case, we just kind of deform the triangular shaped air hole structure. And you can see cross-section view, top of view. And then with the rigorous, here shows the final voids, the structure after regrowth, that's kind of embedded the 2D lattice inside the material. And here is a, a schematic of a structure being flip bonded onto a chip carrier. Here is a device. In this case, there are lots of the, like a, in this case, probably you know, 64 pixel devices individually in, uh, wire bonded for, for testing here, uh, in this case here. And here is just some kind of uh, uh, chip carrier electrode for fan out. You can access individual devices in this way. Here shows device performance. We can see we can get a, like a, you know, one watt each with a, in a nice in a side mode separation ratio, like a single mode operation, about a 40 dB, around a 1045 ish. And here shows the uh, output of the beam. Okay. So here's just a summary in principle now, and in practice, we already demonstrated in a, a few watt uh, large area aperture devices, and also more devices. By in you know, a pioneer, Professor Noda from Japan, you can see uh, already in the demo is 10 watts or more, more than 10 watts in the large device already, some publication already here. And that's the collaborators uh, we're working on this project. So basically addressed basically one of the challenge issues as to power scaling and uh, uh, while maintaining a single mode operation here. So in summary, we believe this uh, is a very promising and uh, in a really powerful technology uh, in a, for, for dyed lasers, in a sense, right? Uh, because it's a unique structures application for LIDAR, free space communication, data consumer electronics, and the many more I will show you here. I summarize where we demonstrate this uh, uh, model for modeling and also experimental demos in this structure here. In summary, I use the same slide I used for the photonic crystal, for, uh, photonics application for, for, for a smart society. Pixel, you can see, you can easily applicable to address many of the challenge issues in those application areas. So I don't have time to address uh, everyone. A simple example, I can say LIDAR, right? You need a, a long distance, a few hundred meter or even kilometer distance of 3D sensing, right? So you need a high power, high beam quality beam to be shining far away and to be able to bounce it back to be able to detect. So those uh, kind of areas, and not even mention some like defense or laser application areas, okay? So there are lots of potentials uh, with this technology here. So that's the first part of the discussion on this kind of uh, pixel or high power laser devices uh, we'll be working on. By the way, don't have to be very high power, don't have to be very high power. You can be skilled to different cavity size. Indeed, we are working on different projects, try to scale to different powers, not only for high power, but also for intermediate, a few hundred watt, a few milliwatts, a few tens of milliwatt. So there are different applications uh, we have different projects to work on. Okay, so that's pretty much the first part of the discussion. The second one, I will look into another kind of related area but it's another platform we be work on uh, in, a, in a, uh, uh, probably uh, uh, in the early stage of my career in a sense, we are still continuing pursuing, is this uh, in a platform of combined photonic crystal structure with memory, okay, to form different platforms, okay. Uh, okay, just a very, it's still photonic crystal structures, 
but it's very different in terms of design principle, operating principles here. Looks similar, but very different in the design, okay? In this case, uh, it's, a two, it's still 72 dimensional lattice structures, very similar to butterfly wings. You can look into this one here, two uh, critical stru uh, periodical structures here. This one we designed so that light can bounce back and forth vertically to have spectrally selective reflections. So for example, if you design right, you can have a piece of silicon, okay? Otherwise, you only have like a 30, you know, four percent reflection based on Snell's law. If you design into some kind of periodic structure, you get 100 percent, okay? Better than your gold reflector or metal, in a sense, okay? And then you can design so that 100 percent transmission, but also you can design to be 100 percent transmission as well. Okay, that's the beauty here, right? So by just simply pattern this structure here, and those is coming to this, uh, you know, fan or resonance or guided, mode resonance or guided resonance, there are different ways to call it. The idea here is basically, it's an interaction of this in, called the in-plane guided resonance due to the periodic structure, like the bouncing back and forth. And this one coupled with the background signal, which is radiation, continuum mode in a third dimension, very much like a, a phantom resonance. Uh, so you have a discrete two uh, modes in play, continuum mode in the third dimension, like interacting without this kind of asymmetric shape resonance, okay? It's like similar to, different from Lorentzian shape, typically it's a kind of symmetrical. This one is asymmetric. It's uh, come after Princeton Professor Uno, so called uh, people sometimes uh, a phantom, called a uh, phantom resonance here. And you can design to be very narrow spectrally. It can be very broad. So you can have in kind of different kind of Q factors in a sense for this here. So with that in mind, that's one of our uh, first uh, in a mural topic. Uh, that's also, you know, I remember one time we met with uh, Professor uh, Ji Feng Liu as well in some of the mural review meetings also on this uh, aspect. We have been looking for this mural uh, on these membrane structures by looking to this photonic lattice where you can have, you know, a high Q, almost even the Q factor, Q factor, very narrow spectrally. Or you can have enhanced absorption by using the called a critical coupling concept. The idea is if you have a very thin layer of absorption, you can design so that you can have that thin layer, I will show you one slide, get 100% absorption. In otherwise, only a few percent absorption, in a sense, by so called a critical coupling concept. And you can look into broadband reflectors to replace the DVRs in the uh, uh, mixer structure we're using now, uh, where is a multi-layer stacking dielectric structure. Now we can do this uh, uh, you know, broadband reflector from a single layer lattice. This combined with a manufacturing process of membrane uh, we call it a transfer printing process. This, okay, like one of the pioneer inventor is Professor John Rogers. Uh, some many of you guys may know, uh, he's now in uh, Northwest. University. So that he was, uh, he published this paper talking about this, how you can be able to release a, a solid structure from a substrate there by using a, an a elastic, <coughs> an, a viscoelastic uh, polymer, PDMS, stem, it's a polymer material. The key here is by controlling the speed, the attention between the PDMS stem and your solid, you know, elastic, you know, solid will change. So if, for example, in this case, if your attention between the layer you want to release from the bottom solid, you have a bottom solid, a solid film, and a flexible PDM uh, structure stem. You when you pick up, if you pick up very fast, which is into this region where you can be able to have a very strong attention between your PDM stem and your solid. So you can pick up, peel off your, your um, solid membrane. And when you do print, you print very slow, you peel up very slow. Then your attention force between your solid thin film and your solid substrate is larger than your attention force between your PDM stem and your film you want to release. So then if you release slowly, the film will left behind there. So that's kind of quite an interesting mechanic uh, uh, behavior here. That's kind of formula, talk about it, like diff two different process. So in principle, basically it's the same PDM stem, be able to retrieve and print by controller speed. Here just use the, in a, a, a principle uh, illustration how this pickup and the print process works. <clears throat> so then we can be able to now release silicon. For example, if a silicon in a silicon SOI platform, 
you can select the HEL oxide below this uh, in the top of silicon device layer. And if you put a PDMS tab there, then you should be able to pick up this top uh, layer, thin layer of silicon, a few hundred nanometers, tens of nanometers, whatever thickness you want, and be able to transfer onto any foreign substrate, right? That's the flexibility here. You can do this uh, so-called transfer printing of this uh, semiconductor thin film, a crystallized structure we call the membranes, onto any substrate, okay? <clears throat> so based on that kind of process, uh, in collaboration with Professor Jack Ma from Wisconsin and Professor John Rogers, now he's in Northwest, we have developed a range of different device platforms by combining photonic crystal cavity and the nanomembrane process here. For example, you can do multi-layer stacking. Uh, one of the devices I will show you later on is kind of new VIXO kind of structures. Basically, you can do multi-layer stacking uh, demonstration. You can do shifted lattice here, okay? You can imagine you have one layer for another layer for by a control lattice offset. You can create lots of interesting structures as well. And of course, you can do flexible as well, easily, on any, any given substrate. So let's summarize kind of, you know, potential heterogeneous integration with different materials, and also using the Fernandez principle in Fernandez capacity for many different in the optical uh, light manipulation. So some examples we demonstrated, the first one is, you know, VIXO structure like, where instead of the DVR structure growth, we can now form this three layer VIXO structure without a DBR. So in this case, we have a single layer photonic crystal mirror or silicon SOI. We transfer a 3-5 membrane thin layer structure on top, and then we release, transfer another top mirror silicon reflector with a single layer photonic crystal structure on top to form this kind of tri-layer sandwich structure here. And this forms a basic VIXO structure where your FP cavity is formed by two reflectors of single layer photonic crystal structure. So here just use that in a schematic in, and then some of the images we have here. And similarly, we can do so-called pixels I mentioned earlier. So in this case, that's what we did before actually, is we designed a you know, photonic crystal cavity structure in this case, the pixel cavity. And then we can Print uh, three five in this case uh, is a quantum wheel in phosphide quantum wheel structure at 1.55 micron on top to form this uh, hybrid pixel structure as well. In the sense, right? So we have been working on this actually uh, uh, for many years uh, of these two type of laser structures. And the application is you can also design so that you can your pixel can be long wavelengths. Because one of the limitations for DBR-based VIXO now is mostly at the galamosinate based one micron. You can do any wavelengths. You are not limited by your DBR anymore. So you can really onto any material for different wavelengths. And also, uh, as I already mentioned earlier, this kind of structure can extend to high power as well for, for high power pixels. So that's one kind of application using the reflector property uh, principle here. The second one is uh, high Q cavity. I mentioned you can do that kind of offset lattice. And potentially you can get, you know, 10 million, whatever theory, uh, infinite Q structures by control uh, separation of two photonic lattice, also like lattice offset of the two layer here. So here's just an example, how we did it by the transfer printing process. We make a first layer here, and we do a thermal oxidation from a thin oxide, and then we transfer a membrane, unpatterned membrane on top, and then we do another even process on top by a line even process. So then you can control the offset of the two layer here. And the, th the separation can be controlled by this uh, thermal oxide in between. This is the FIB cutout. You can see a top crystal silicon, bottom crystal silicon, and a thin oxide layer in between. That's kind of structure uh, was made. Here shows the top view, you know, uh, uh, structure, the multiple device here. This one shows kind of zoom in, shows kind of in the bottom air hole, top air hole here, you can see, with a uh, controlled offset. What's the application, okay? So one of the applications you can see right away, we talk about AR, VR glasses. One of the AR, VR challenges is your lens is too bulky, right? Oculars, some other devices, it's too big, right? So one of the challenges is how to reduce those kind of bulk optical lens, uh, some kind of field design. So one of the potential applications could be design those kind of uh, narrow, uh, narrow uh, filter here, so then you can have most light being transmissive, so you can still see through, but some light reflect back, RGB, for example, three light, reflect back, 
then that can can do projection into your eye. For example, then eventually your glasses can be transmissive, except a few colors going back like a projection onto your eye. Right? That's kind of a, a, a simple example of uh, how RGB can be uh, filter can be used based on the structure. The third area is I mentioned the absorption enhancement. In this case, use called a critical coupling concept to get a total absorption. For example, in this case, we have a very thin layer of graphene, okay, of the nanometer range, right? So generally speaking, if you don't do anything, single pass transmission is 2.3%. But if I put this graphene layer on top of my silicon photonic crystal structure, and if it design right, that silicon photonic crystal is also transferred on the glass already. So otherwise, there are no absorption if your wavelength is around 1.55, right? So the only absorption layer is a single layer graphene. And if you don't do anything right, if you don't do anything, it's 2.3% if you shine light through. But if you design right, you can get a, about 50%, the symmetry principle, right? No, it, you know, at the most, they can get a 50% in this case. If you add a mirror on the bottom to break the symmetry on a multiple dimension, you get 100%. So now you can have a very simple structure to get a 100% absorption from a very thin layer structure. That could be also interesting, especially if you care about a spectral selective uh, lattice structure here. Okay? What's the application? So enhanced absorption, you can you know, look into devices where absorption coefficient may be not large. Uh, we have a project we call intelligent surface. You can selectively bouncing back and forth of your light by modulating the surface property, you can tune the resonance. So it could be interesting. And for free space communications. And one of the examples we did also is to actively modulate the resonance in the field of structure to achieve this called specialized modulators with high speed. So this one demonstrated amplitude modulation where it's same as the one I showed before, it's double lattice for the structure, it's a filter essentially. That means light passing through with a certain resonance and if you adjust modulate like refractive index of the material silicon, you can tune in like resonance away. So if you shine a single wavelength light coming, your resonance is being shifted on and off away from your wavelength of the light. In this case, you can modulate your basically the intensity the passing beam. So in this case, you can get a very high speed uh, modulation. In this case, we, uh, without much optimizing, you get a few hundred megahertz already, which is already much higher than uh, technology we have now, whether it's liquid crystal spectral modulator or so called a deformable mirror, that's a kombucha technology using now, is only probably in a hundreds of kilohertz or megahertz range. So in this case, we can easily get into hundreds of megahertz, and we are looking to even gigahertz applications. We have a project to work on this. We're looking for LIDAR, beam steering, uh, okay, communications. And recently, we are looking for two pi phase shift as well. One of the key issues is when you do the optical phase array or beam steering, whatever, in the phase tuning. So we designed some lattice uh, structure where you can get a very good reflection, but also two pi phase tuning. So now not only you can modulate the index, you can modulate your phase. That's more interesting as well. So again, that's where you can look into LIDAR, looking for uh, adaptive imaging to compensate, for example, your propagation of the beam in the atmosphere or some sort, right, for faster beam compensation. And, uh, and also can do sensing, phase-based sensing applications as well. Finally, sensors, okay. So in this case, uh, we looked into, okay, same platform for the structures. We collaborated with the Professor Sang from UTA. She's an expert in microfluidics, et cetera. So we tried to put the sensor into a microfluidic channel. In this case, we're looking for Gas sensing, also uh, you know liquid sen liquid sensing, etc. Uh, so you we look at different kind of platforms. You can see here we embedded our 2D photonic lattice uh, in the channel, and we can coat the polymer so you can do this kind of gas sensing. Uh, and the ultimate goal you will see later on. Uh, we use this one for really the so called gas analyzer. If you do chemistry, you know that gas chromatography is utilized for analyzing the gas composition. It's big, bulky. In a, in, a, in a chemical lab, you will see those things. Um, and you can do pressure sensing, temperature sensing as well. You will see later on. So, one of the, as I mentioned, it's kind of for environmental modeling, for biosensing. 
is not only can sense in one set, uh, one uh, gas. You can sense the composition of your gas. That's kind of interesting feature. So you can multiple multiple peaks represent different gas here. In a sense, so then you can be able to analyze, for example, your breath. What kind of composition you breathe? CO two, oxygen, whatever other things, right? Or environmentally, what kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, toxic gas you may see, you know, in a sense. There are lots of potential applications. And we try to make, the key is to make it a small, compact, potentially on chip. We have a project looking for using an on chip spectrometer to looking for on chip integration uh, for these kind of applications. So, our ultimate vision on this aspect is looking for an you know, on chip optical imaging sensing where you can see we can have light source with different spectral potentials. We can have also, I didn't talk too much on this imaging, multi-spectral detector side here. We can use kind of potential spectral selective imaging. We talk about you know, uh, spectral enhanced in you know, the graphene, for example, or three five quantum wave material, right? We can look for modular junction. We can do different uh, meta surface structure design to optimize to form this uh, uh, the spectral selective sensing, and then of course the sensing element I mentioned as well. So then we can stack all of them together, cascade, right? You can imagine kind of tandem structures uh, for this on chip sensing applications. So I will end up with one example. Um, Collaboration with Professor John Rogers uh, on this uh, intracranial pressure sensing for the brain, essentially. Uh, uh, the idea is they're looking for, can we have something, optical sensor, to be implanted into a human brain to monitor the pressure and the temperature in the optical domain, okay? And optical have quite a, a few interesting applications. Uh, advantage, for example, low infection risk, low tissue damage, uh, and then uh, no EMR yeah, kind of issues. So as you can, you know, compatible with uh, magnetic resonance image, et cetera. So one of the things we also look into is uh, also uh, John and his group, and, and I guess, uh, uh, perf uh, and, uh, uh, Fei, I guess, not here, right? They work on this uh, bioresorbable uh, structures based on silicon here, where you can dissolve this very thin layer of crystal silicon after you implant in a human body. So you can basically dissolve this probe once it's implanted. You don't have to retrieve it to take it out, the second surgery. So that's kind of one of the interesting uh, aspect also on top of this uh, new optical structure. So we use a kind of thin layer of photonic crystal structures based on single crystal silicon. Uh, we designed so that we can be able to um, use this for pressure sensing by design to a cavity. And then depending on the deformation of the pixel lattice, the shape, of course, the lattice as well as the uh, lattice configuration will change as you change your shape or the structure here. So we use this membrane to be able to monitor the pressure. For example, here shows some of the uh, different pressures. Uh, we will monitor and the relation between the peak shift of the resonance and the pressure here. You can correlate very well here based on this 2D lattice structure. And we also compare the performance to the traditional, you know, uh, for the crystal, or the FE resonance structure called in the fiber pro cavity, it's actually a two uh, thin layer structure, parallel mirror structure, without a photonic lattice, right? Uh, here, shows an example here also, uh, that's kind of parallel, you know, two uh, crystal, uh, single layer membrane silicon crystal structure. And again, same thing, you can do this uh, peak wavelength shifting uh, for the pressure sensing as well. And there are lots of comparisons, we we'll probably want to get into details in the structure here. Just uh, finish up with this uh, uh, kind of in vivo measurement on the animal study you can see here. And we have a uh, you know, calibration uh, commercial probe on the side, try to calibrate and monitor. And in fact, you know, uh, for this uh, you know, peak wavelength shift versus the ICP the pressure here, and also ICT for the temperature monitoring. So they kind of agree very well. You can calibrate, you can monitor both pressure and temperature. Uh, even in the uh, in animal study here. So in summary, on this second part, uh, we look into this crystalline silicon nanomarine platform uh, where one of the you know, really emerging area is this uh, uh, bio-optical applications uh, for you know, sensing and uh, potentially for imaging. Uh, you can see there you know, some devices on this uh, spiral waveguide structures, uh, bioresorbable uh, waveguides for light delivery, and you can also for this pressure uh, sensing, temperature sensing, and then you can also do uh, like a multicolor 
spectral imaging where you can resolve the spectral information. Here, some of the work uh, based on the structural design uh, in our group and it was demonstrated, fabricated some of the lab uh, in uh, John Rogers' group there. So let's give us lots of kind of uh, tools uh, for this uh, uh, potentially uh, bioimaging, biosensing area. So here is kind of my you know, kind of summary slide on what I talked today. Uh, again, looking at the photonic crystal lasers and the memory photonics as a two platform. I talked about like high power laser, a pixel, as a kind of very powerful platform uh, for many, many applications. Uh, I touched upon briefly on this uh, you know, uh, MR pixel based on this uh, uh, integration of the, in the photonic crystal structure and the membrane photonics. That's kind of in you know, one of the you know, uh, milestones uh, we were demonstrating this kind of uh, structure with this tri-layer uh, structure for surface emitters. And on the other side, looking for applications in you know, sensing, imaging, I talk about you know, uh, microfluidics, uh, you know, bioresorbable FP cavity and the sensing, and the flexible devices, and based on different platforms, uh, I mentioned in the uh, bilayer structures, couple of cavities, modules, et cetera. That's all some references, and also uh, we had a book talk about some of the summary of the previous work we demonstrated before, I think. Thank you.